WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM's Master of Business Administration is designed to accommodate the career needs of professionals across a variety of work organizations. More information at business.udmercy.edu. Live from Radio Row in the historic Grand Ballroom on Mackinac Island, I am Nick Austin bringing you WDET's continued day two coverage of the 2024 Mackinac Policy Conference this hour. As we've been discussing, the theme for this year's conference is bridging the future together. And a big area of focus we've been hearing about is education. In fact, at the conference this morning, when discussing the need for higher education, Sandy Barua, who runs the uh, Detroit Chamber, quoted General Motors CEO Mary Barra, Mary Barra saying, businesses go where the talent is. But while many may think of our major universities when discussing higher education, there are other institutions that are important to this mission. One of those, for example, is the College for Creative Studies, which has joined the Michigan Colleges Association and the Detroit and Kalamazoo Promise Scholarship programs this year. What's the goal? Making education more accessible for Michigan residents. So where does that fit into the theme of what we need to keep more talent and bring in more talent in our state for the benefit of the economy? To discuss this and a whole lot more, we're joined by the College of Creative Studies President, Don Tusky. Don, thanks for joining us on WDET. Well, thank you for having me, Nick. This is really exciting to be here again this year. I really enjoy being here all this week and listening to a lot of great speakers. Um, and so it's really wonderful. So thank you. You know, I think of the change that the College for Creative Studies has gone through over the years. I remember back when it was the Center for Creative mm -hmm. Studies and I started playing clarinet. That's where I got my first clarinet right. lessons. So we really know about the arts institution that has developed from there. So let's just start here. Where do you you see the College for Creative Studies and its role in supporting Michigan's creative economy right now? That's a great, a great question and we'd like to think of ourselves as helping to create the future, to create what's coming next and so we have a lot of great students that are into design as well as the arts and so we work with a lot of different companies in the for-profit world and the non-profit world to provide creative talent through what we call sponsored projects. So Mary Barra knows that we work with General Motors but also Ford and Stellantis John Deere, uh, Rock, Rock Ventures, and uh, Rocket Mortgage would do a lot of collaboration with different organizations as well as uh, uh, government agencies to provide creative thinking, new, new products, as well as uh, better processes, user experience, and user interaction. And so at, at College for Creative Studies, which is now CCS Detroit online, in terms of you can see it that way, we do a range of interactions with, uh, just this year alone, over 300 companies that we worked with in one capacity or another. Well, let's unpack that, right? Because, okay. again, when I think, uh, I think a lot of people, and you do great stuff in the arts world, which I know you're proud of, but in terms of figuring out, like, design, what that mm -hmm. tangibly looks like, mm -hmm. what a GM would need mm -hmm. from people who graduate from right. the College for right. Creative Studies. Maybe someone listening now right. who never thought about the right. College for Creative Studies as an option. Can you give us examples? Absolutely. So when it comes to um, automobile design, transportation design, mobility design, you need engineers, of course, but you also need designers who understand how things look, how things work together with engineers. And so we provide a lot of designers for product design, for transportation design, and we really interact with, uh, with uh, these companies that want different views of the world, with different designs that can go into their vehicles, whether it's a truck, a bus, um, maybe it's a, uh, in space now. We had SpaceX on campus a couple weeks ago. Um, we have a student doing an internship this summer with SpaceX, looking at all types of transportation. So being in Detroit, being able to work with the big three and providing really great designers is really important. But we also work with other wide range of companies. So when you're thinking about the mission that you guys have, for example, with smaller universities, like I, I know you understand you are, uh, first generation mm -hmm. students, right? Getting people who may not even have thought about going to college mm -hmm. to start that. Mm -hmm. What are you guys doing in terms of working to help promote first generation students who might not have thought of college as an option? Well, as you mentioned, we're part of the Detroit Promise. And for 20 years, our community arts partnership has provided experiences for students to uh, participate in, in programs that are part of CCS. We, got, we have great sponsors in terms of the, the Ford Motor Company, General Motors, 
uh, Stellantis, uh, Rock, uh, Rocket Mortgage, but we also um, do a great job of scholarshiping more and more students. 30% of our students are Pell Grant students. So that means we need to work really hard to provide an affordable ex experience of being a private independent college. So more scholarship money. I spent a lot of time um, making sure that I raise money for our students to make sure that they can afford to be at CCS. And that's an ongoing process. Yeah. And so even this fall, our price for incoming students will be less this fall than last fall. And we worked hard to make that happen. And it's not easy. And a lot of privates, certainly like CCS, we owe it's our ethical responsibility to make sure that we get every penny out of every dollar from our foundations, from our donors, to make sure that our students have the be very best experience. And then part of that also is making sure that we have strong uh, career services so that as they go through CCS, they have experiences with internships, with sponsored projects, being able to interact with the larger world. So even before they graduate, they have a really great opportunity to have a job or at graduation. And our placement rate has been in the, in the mid-80s over the last couple of years in, their, in the students' major. So part of it is, is being more affordable on the front door, working with more K-12 through um, institutions to provide more art and design opportunities for students while they're still in high school, but then also providing more scholarship once they come to CCS. And we have a pre-college program that we scholarship students all the time from Detroit and surrounding areas so they can come and get a flavor of what art and design can do. And that really companies want creativity. They want students, they want things that, that want products and experiences that other people aren't thinking about. And that's where art and design students come in. They, they're thinking really differently and that's why they're part of creating that future. Yeah, and I, first of all, to hear that the tuition has gone down, that's kind of unheard of. Yeah, well, the, well, the, the cost of attendance, yeah. so what the tuition really hasn't gone down, but the, okay. the cost boards more scholarship money. Gotcha, which is also important. We should be pulling from the buckets where we have them, but you also mentioned about how the College for Creative Studies fits in the greater educational ecosystem. Let's start with that interaction that you're talking about at the high school yeah. level. Are there examples <laughs> that you can tell us about of what you're doing to help maybe prime some of these students here in high school who might not be so familiar what are you guys doing well pre-college is yeah. one of them where students can come and spend three or four weeks with us and learn about art design and what it takes to, to be a designer for one of the companies we also there are nonprofits like design connect which cre actually help create curriculum for high schools we've worked with individual high schools and there are teachers to provide them with with design education so they can teach students more about design yeah so there really is really about trying to interact more with k-12 through so it's more of a seamless transition if a student wants to come to ccs they've been exposed more to it in, in high school generally speaking art and design has not been something that's always been part of 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 high school experiences certainly as i mentioned engineering is but when it comes to overall product design car design, any type of design, there needs to be a really strong part of design and art involved with the engineering. Yeah, we're speaking with Don Tusky, who's the president of the College of Creative Studies. And Don, when we're talking about technology design, one of the areas that's been a focus, I just heard about it here up at Mackinac, artificial intelligence, Absolutely. which has people a little concerned, Absolutely. especially in the worlds of art and design, yeah. copyright, all of this. Yep. Can you tell us, as this is a growing field, what the college, what CCS is doing yep. in this area? Well, it's, <clears throat> um, artificial intelligence is a tear. It's just going to increase. It actually puts a premium on having really good artists and designers who know how to use it appropriately and to create with artificial in intelligence to actually make better design, more inclusive design, make help make design that's better for more people. And so you need really artists who understand design principles to be able to do that. So for us, we're looking at it as something that it's a very powerful tool. We actually have uh, policies for how to use it at all levels at CCS. We're actually one of the leading art design schools uh, that have a policy for it. We've done presentations at national conferences about how to use artificial intelligence, when to use it, and when not to use it. And then uh, some of the things you're talking about in terms of intellectual property. So it's a whole new area like some other areas, but it's one of the most powerful things that, that's, that, that, that humans have now, but it's got to be used appropriately. And that's where I think artists and designers are really thoughtful about how to do that. And we've spent a lot of time in the last couple of years to really define the best ways to use it and the most responsible ways to use it. So, and, and that leads to things like, um, you know, the, I mentioned SpaceX, but we have an alum who's at Boston Dynamics as a senior robot designer at age 24, partly because her understanding about artificial intelligence, about product design, about psychology, 
And so it's really trying to, like, we like to think we're not happy just being on the cutting edge. We're creating that cutting edge. Yeah. And that involves artificial intelligence. Yeah, and it also involves art. You mentioned the word inclusivity. Yep. Detroit is the basis, CCS Detroit, it's in the name. But I can tell you from art spaces, sometimes, especially majority black city, some of our black artists don't always feel the most comfortable in yeah. some of the more historical art spaces. Right. What is CCS doing to try to bridge that gap, get some of that inclusivity, get more of students in there who can have that dynamic uh, portion learn and benefit yeah, the Yeah, we university? do that in a couple of different ways. We work with a lot of schools, but we also work through, I mentioned earlier, our community arts partnership that for 20 years has been working out in different communities helping artists of all ages but especially young young students to learn about art and design and all the different careers so that's the first part to give them a flavor about the whole art and design world um, joining the Detroit promise that actually helps us connect with more students coming from Detroit and then making sure that they're successful at, at CCS and then also inviting more people in and connecting with our alums already in Detroit and so we put a big push over the last three or four years to make sure that we are connecting and supporting our local artists, whether they're doing murals in Detroit, whether they're working for one of the big companies, whether they're a practicing artist, to make sure that they feel supported and engaged. And then also, in, in addition to that, to make it more possible for our uh, area artists, especially from Detroit, who can have access back to campus as an alums, but also inviting students of all ages to campus. And that's actually the pre-college program in our continuing education. We're constantly expanding that and providing more scholarships. Yeah, we mentioned that last dollar, or the Detroit Promise, last dollar scholarship, right? Making sure Detroit residents can have a tuition-free path yep. to getting a degree that you referred to there. Don, before I let you go, got about a minute left, okay. but I do want to get an idea, you know, again, we have the big universities, College for Creative Studies, very important to our educational ecosystem. Who's a student out there that might not be thinking about CCS that you guys see like, no, you would be a perfect fit to come here to maybe get some people's minds going about this is a place that could work for me. Sure. Um, sometimes it obviously involves students who like to draw or paint, yeah. but more and more it's students who like to work with computers, who are gamers. We have a, a game design program. We have an esports team that does very well and oh, competes nice. very well with the bigger schools in Michigan. I wonder if, if I, I can get my eligibility that. back. And, I might have to join that. that. And so it, when it comes to technology and design, it's, it's, it's certainly the traditional things we think about, but it's also the technological. If you're, in, if you're interested into the game part, if you're interested into how computers can work, if you're interested in the apps, user experience, user interaction, if you're interested in augmented reality and virtual reality, all kind of things around technology that can help design, that's something where students don't always think about in art and design school. And because we work with so many different companies in the for-profit world and non-profit world, Again, our students do very well with jobs and careers right, right out of CCS, and we're really proud of that because that's important for parents to know as well that we're looking at it not just the four years at CCS, but really making sure that they have a career path. And anything with technology and computers is important. So if you're into that, there's probably a major at CCS that you, that you get excited about, and we have lots of scholarship money that, that's available to all students. Don Tusky, president of the College of Creative Studies. Thanks for the, taking the time to speak with me on Mackinac Island. Right, great. Nick, great seeing you. Thanks again, and it's a pleasure. All right. This is the Mackinac Policy Conference against 2024 edition here, day two. And when we return, we're going to speak with the executive director of the Song Foundation, find out what they're doing for entrepreneurship when we return. This is our continuing special coverage of the 2024 Mackinac Policy Conference, day two up here from the historic Grand Ballroom, WDET. I'm Nick Austin, and one of the focuses, as we continue to mention to you, it's bridging the future together. And what does that look like for us in Detroit? A very important part 
helping to create more entrepreneurship, more business and wealth. We always talk about the wealth gap, the income inequality gap, especially facing residents in Detroit, black residents. One of the areas that we're trying to help build that up is through uh, entrepreneurship. And one of the organizations that is working to strengthen that is the Song Foundation. To learn more about these efforts, we're joined right now by Kalia Burt Gaston, who's the founding executive director of the Song Foundation. Kalia, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Nick. Let's just start out from here. Uh, I want to hear in your words, what is the Song Foundation? And I especially want to know what inspired the name. Oh, well, the Song Foundation is named after our co-founders, Doug and Lynn Song. And so many people know Doug was uh, co-founder of Duo Security, uh, which was Michigan's first unicorn. So first billion dollar company. He exited in, um, I think, or 2008 and decided to take some of those proceeds and start a family foundation. And so I came on board about two and a half years ago. And really the purpose of the foundation is to amplify prosperity and equity. And we also say amplify joy uh, within our region. And so that includes Detroit, Dearborn, Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti, uh, as well as Flint, Michigan. Right. And right at the top of the website, if you go there, it says advancing revolutionary ideas rooted in community. I know that's intentional language. What does that mean for you and how's the foundation doing? Yeah, so I think the first thing is we invest in people, we invest in ideas, and we invest in organizations. And so it doesn't have to be a formal uh, 501c3. We were the first checked in with Black Tech Saturdays, uh, which was an idea that Johnny and Alexa Turnage had, and it's grown right to a community of 400 unique uh, visitors to Black Tech Saturdays. And we do want to be revolutionary. We want to fund organizations that are disrupting the status quo, that are looking for new ways uh, to grow our region, to grow Detroit. Um, and we also are revolutionary because we are centering black, brown, and immigrant-led organizations. So last year, nearly 80% of our funding went to black, brown, and immigrant-led organizations within the region. So are there a specific <laughs> success story? You reference how that money, 80%, has been going to these communities. Can you tell us any specific success stories that uh, really show what you've been doing? Yeah, I mean, I think Black Tech Saturdays. Right. We've also supported um, Force Detroit, which is an organization in Detroit that does a lot of um, kind of violence intervention work. They were a recipient of resources from the city of Detroit, uh, kind of more of a community driven response to Shot Spotter, and they have seen, you know, nearly a 70% reduction in crime in their geography. And so I think think, you know, grassroots solutions work, engagement works, right? And so we as a foundation want to support that type of leadership and community. Yeah, and to put a pin on it, right, you're taking money and putting it in people's pockets. You'd mentioned, of course, that it doesn't have to be the 501c3 route, the nonprofit route. Does that mean there's also investment in for-profit entities? How does that work for you guys? Yeah, so we don't necessarily, you know, invest in for-profit entities, okay. but we are supporting the ecosystem, right, the broader ecosystem of entrepreneurs of tech entrepreneurs now obviously Doug you know is an angel investor and so he definitely writes checks but you know our goal with tech and entrepreneurship is to really ensure that equity is centered uh, uh, centered at um, the, the very beginning in an economic development strategy that's prioritizing the knowledge economy. So, you know, over the years in Detroit, we've heard about manufacturing. We know that we have a strong legacy in Detroit, in the region, and in our state. But the reality is those jobs have gone away. And neighboring states have replaced a lot of those jobs with higher wage jobs, um, you know, in tech companies, in tech-enabled companies that are growing and that are scaling into global entities. We we haven't done that at the same rate and so we um, need to figure it out very quickly <laughs> and we also need to make sure right that Detroiters as well as people living in Flint and in Dearborn right and in Ypsilanti aren't left behind um, and you know I, I get the fear you know my parents and grandparents um, definitely you know whether it was the summer or for their career worked in the plants growing up right but those jobs uh, were good paying jobs it helped to build the black middle class but a lot of those jobs have gone away and so as um, you know the largest city in our state Detroit has got to figure out what is our 
future economic engine. We're speaking with Kalia Bird Gaston, founding executive director of the Song Foundation. Kalia, you mentioned the term uh, investing in an ecosystem of entrepreneurs. You know, I think of this idea as wait, more entrepreneurs out there. Some might say, doesn't that make it harder for me to be an entrepreneur? More competition. Why do you think it's important to have an ecosystem? Do you mean more entrepreneurs out there? Why is that important? Well, if you look at the high right failure rate of you know, businesses, small businesses, medium-sized business, even tech companies, right? It's a high failure rate. It could be 90, 95%. So we need more people trying, <laughs> yeah. right? right? And so the more people we have trying, hopefully we'll get to a threshold, yeah. right, of startups in the city. But if we, um, you know, discourage people from trying or we don't invest in those ideas, we may never have the next duo, right? Um, there's a young gentleman by the name of Darren Riley who has a, a startup called Just air and he's one of the brightest uh, founders locally he's actually from Houston graduated from Carnegie Mellon and came to Detroit and uh, got asthma for the first time in his life and mm. so he's created an air monitoring system that will help residents and municipalities understand the high quality or the lack of quality in the air and then that message will go out to constituents and to nonprofits to better serve those geographies you know, Darren has million dollars worth of contracts from cities all over the country and from Grand Rapids as well as Wayne County. And so that's an example, right, of a young man who saw a problem, right. could take his background, his own personal background and his technical training and come up with a solution. And so, you know, we want him to be in an ecosystem that is investing in him, that is helping to uh, support him and help him grow. Yeah. You know, I, fugitive <laughs> dust is something we've talked about on this show. So that's it is right. uh, real linkings together where yes you see these municipalities that need these items mm -hmm. but we're up here on the island you're up here the theme of the conference bridging the future together with a specific focus on collaboration mm -hmm. across divides for you how does this theme fit into the goals of the song foundation well, the reality is, you know, economic growth, economic development is a and should be right a bipartisan issue. And I think a lot of times uh, we see it as maybe something that one party is better at than the other. And so right here in Michigan, we, we are a, um, a swing state. And so we've got to learn how to work across administrations. We have to learn how to work across political lines to do what is better for our state, for the city of Detroit, and for our region. And so that comes down to collaboration. That comes down to finding common ground, right? So we have a session later with the LG and Victor Wang from Right to Start. And the whole focus, one of the questions that we're going to ask is, what can we do, right, between administrations to ensure that the momentum that we've created, right, for tech and, and high growth, high wage um, economies and businesses here continues? Yeah. What does it look like, though, right? You mentioned Darren earlier. You know, I, some folks who haven't been an entrepreneur, haven't started, they don't understand the supports, what's necessary to get that yeah. started. Can you kind of explain to us? Because it seems to me like he might be an outlier to be able to, from where he started, kind of uh, create such a, a, a device or system. Yeah, so startups need flexible early capital, yeah. right? And here in Michigan, unfortunately, um, our capital is a little slow to be deployed, and it's also less... Um, it's less risk, it's it's more risk adverse, yeah. right? So if you look at our neighboring states like Indiana, Ohio, there are multiple funds and multiple mechanisms for them to support entrepreneurs in those early stages. In Michigan, it's almost like you got to show and prove, right? right? <laughs> Before you'll be invested in. And, and so we lose entrepreneurs to other states, you know, other cities, Austin, Pittsburgh, Tulsa. I'm like, I know Detroit is cooler than Tulsa, right? But <laughs> <laughs> Tulsa has done a wonderful job of really linking like a high growth economy yeah. with um, a strategy to restore some of the economic wealth that was lost during Black Wall Street. They also stole our WNBA basketball team, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> Good right. on you, that's the right. OKC shock or whatever. <laughs> but before we let you go, uh, for people who are looking to obtain a grant, uh, especially from you, yeah. what uh, what pro what's the process for them and what recommendations would you have for them on that application? Yeah, so you can visit our website at song.foundation. It's a three to five minute form that you can fill out, introduce yourself, let us know what you're doing, let us know how much money you need and how your work is aligned with our stated priorities. 
Kalila, uh, Kalia Burt Gaston, founding executive <laughs> director of the Song Foundation. Thank you so much for joining our special coverage from Mackinac Island. <laughs> Thank you. This is 1019 WDET. I am Nick Austin. And when we return, we're going to hear from Mishmash host Shana Roth in a conversation she had with Speaker of the House Joe Tate. WDET, our special coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference, day two of the event here from 2024. But I'm not the only person up here with you. Also, we've had Stephen Henderson and Mish Mash's own Shana Roth, who's been conducting interviews with some of the top lawmakers in the state, including a conversation that she had with the Speaker of the House, Joe Tate. Here's that conversation for you now. So, Speaker Tate, earlier this month, a group of protesters laid down outside of your office at the state capitol. They were protesting legislation to change the state's no-fault laws. You want to hold off on those bills until the budget is done. What is the plan there with changes to no-fault? Where are we at with no-fault? I think with what you're saying, you know, right now, I'm, I was here in 2019. Actually, we were out on the porch when we were making this announcement mm -hmm. uh, for auto no-fault, and that was 40 years in the making. I think no policy is perfect, and that's certainly the case with uh, auto no-fault reform, which is incredibly complex at the end of the day. I think for me, and working with my colleagues, is just figuring out what is going to be the next step and the right next step. And as we know and as we've been seeing, even over the past couple of years, um, with you know cost of living rising costs you know us we've been trying to work to make sure that we're continuing to put money back in people's pockets um, in terms of, of of that and cost of living so for me really want to be able to focus you know where we make these changes we want to ensure that we're we're not making it cost prohibitive when it comes to auto insurance rates because that's an important piece um, you know, because we don't want to, you know, in particular in Detroit, you know, there are families that make decisions where they're going to pay their auto insurance or their utilities. Um, and we want to reduce um, that choice um, there uh, in terms in terms of that. So that's what we're looking at. And I think there, there are several different paths, but we want to make sure that we're focused on the right one. And right now, the legislature is really hyper focused on the budget. Are there any sticking points that are holding up the process? No, I, you know, the great part about it is, you know, since being in this role for the past year and a half, we do have one budget under under our belt. And the great part about part about it is, you know, not only House Democrats, but Senate Democrats and the governor as well, too. Our values are aligned in terms of uh, how we want to support the state moving forward. Um, so I think you're going to see as we go into the negotiation process, I, um, uh, I think that's going to be something that won't be as much of an issue. I mean, we're going to have our points of difference. We, all, we always do. But I think uh, you'll see, you know, a similar trying to work off a similar timeline from last year in terms of getting the budget done, but feel really good about where we're at right now. What in the budget that you're looking at is like a real important yeah. chunk for you? What are you really hoping to get yeah. passed? So in, in one piece, something that, that my colleague, Representative Regina Weiss, had worked on last year around the budget is the Opportunity Index Fund in the school aid budget. So essentially putting more dollars uh, into areas where, where students go to school um, in those areas that historically have been disinvested. So we've almost gotten to about a billion dollars um, there. I think continuing to move the needle up, especially areas of concentrated poverty to make sure that there are resources in, in those schools. So I think maintaining that, and then also I would very much like to grow that uh, as, as well too. A couple other things that, that we're looking at that we've kind of baked into the House pass budget. One is the Public Safety Trust Fund. Uh, so we moved legislation out of the House uh, around that. So a dedicated fund to those areas uh, for um, when you look at 
uh, historically high high crime. You know how are we where are we sending those resources to those uh, local first responders for for additional support, and then the revenue sharing trust fund as well too, which is another area we talk a, a lot about how we're we supporting our locals. So that's another place that. I think I, I would like to see some movement and, and have that be in the final product of the budget. You called 2023 the most productive year ever, and now we are in 2024. We're kind of hitting the halfway mark. Do you think this has been a productive year so far? Yes. Um, you know, for us, you know, up to this point, so for the past year and a half, um, you know, we have sent about 370 pieces of legislation uh, to the governor's desk. So you look at the volume for the past uh, year and a half, it has been significant. We were in a place where we were 54-54, but we, we still were able and managed to get things done, worked in a, in a bipartisan fashion around that. Um, so I think it is certainly something that's productive. And I think what you've seen, the legislation that we passed last year that actually went into effect, uh, such as, you know, common sense gun violence uh, reduction, and you look at uh, expansion of EITC, you know, all of that hit in February as well, too. So it actually we are able to, to see that implementation begin to take place in that work. So I think it's been a productive year. And once we get the budget done, I think, you know, being able to um, tell that story as well in terms of the work that we've done, I think it's been incredibly productive. Yeah, and we've only got about two months before summer recess and Democrats have their trifecta majority. Aside from finishing the budget, what are your priorities before everybody, you know, takes off and runs for the hills for the summer to campaign for the most part? You know, we're still looking at ways to lower costs uh, for Michigan residents. I mean, we know that there's there continues to be a need. I think uh, Democrats have been leading on that and 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 hearing Michigan residents ar around that. Um, but we know that you know we can do more things uh, around that as well. At the beginning of the year, I talked a lot about you know seeing what opportunities there are around reducing prescription drug costs. I think so. That's one area that we still want to want to take a look at um, as, as well. You know, economic development is always, you know, uh, there as well because we've been working on it, again, for the, since the beginning of this legislative session. So seeing what comes out of uh, ongoing conversations uh, there too. But top of mind, first and foremost, is going to, going to be getting a budget done uh, for Michigan. Talk to me more about that economic development package. What is in there and what do you feel is really going to be the most beneficial for Michiganders if it passes? So I think there are different pieces uh, that we've been working on for the entire legislative session. You know, that the House moved um, an R&D package uh, last year, um, as well as a Renaissance Zone reform, which we got to the governor's desk just recently, uh, which is going to be a huge and an added tool, and actually is going to be very helpful to the Detroit Medical Center uh, as as well too. Um, so ongoing, you know, we're looking at um, what we've done at the beginning of the last year. I know there are a lot of conversations around reforming a SOAR. There's a payroll tax package as well too that we're looking at. Um, also looking at, you know, how are we, how are we, you know, working with other issues that align with economic development that are complementary to it, so such as housing, how can we create more investments, how can we work uh, on policy that, that creates and spurs more housing unit development across the, the state. So that's something that we're looking at. You know, transit has been in the conversation as well, too, because that is very complementary to, to um, economic development as, as well. So it's all kind of an ongoing conversation that we've had since, since January of 2022. <laughs> and, it's, and it's been exciting. Uh, so it's just a continuation of that conversation. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the upcoming election. How confident are you feeling about Democrats holding on to that 56-54 majority right now? Very. Um, I think we've been incredibly productive. Um, and in terms of, and, and that tells a story. You know, we're, all of us, all 110 of us have to go out and we have our job interviews uh, coming up in both August and, and November. Um, but 
House Democrats have been focused on putting people first. We've been focused on getting to yeses in terms of legislation to support. Um, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, you know, our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have um, been saying no to a lot of things. And that's not what Michiganders want. They want to find solutions um, and they want opportunities uh, to be created. They want bipartisanship. They want that work to move the state forward. So we feel really good and we are building towards victory uh, as we should. And we're going to tell our story as we go into November, but I feel very confident about where we're at. I'm curious. I know you've had hundreds of bills go to the governor's desk. Has there been any room for bipartisanship in uh, in the House and in the Senate? And, and talk to us more about how Republicans and Democrats have been able to work together. Yeah, absolutely. So the majority of our bills that we move are, you know, almost two thirds of them are bipartisan. Um, and that's something that, you know, you, you're not, you don't always hear, you, you hear more about the policy disagreements uh, that we have, you know, and, and that's, that's natural um, there. But, you know, when you look at some of the work that, that we've been able to do, the majority of it is, is bipartisan. Um, but some of the big areas around, um, you know, you name it, you know, whether it's, you know, support for reproductive health, um, you know, those those can be challenges, uh, so on and so forth. That's what, you know, that's what we see. But the majority of the work that we do is bipartisan and in, in nature. And that's something that I, I really want to continue to focus on and work on, because I think that's where the best policies come from when they're when they're bipartisan uh, in nature. But there is more room to grow there. President Biden has brought up some mixed feelings among Democrats. I'm curious, I know we're constantly hearing about an enthusiasm gap with, with President Biden. Do you think he's going to be helpful or harmful for Democrats this year, particularly in those down ticket races? I think, I think he will be helpful. I think what the president has done, uh, I think he will go down in history as one of the most effective presidents that we've had uh, in, in this nation. And I think that's going to be, you know, um, something that 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 we will see i think that's what historians will write about but i i think what we're seeing as well and as we are our, as we're racing towards november you know look at the president his presence in the state of michigan you know he was just at the freedom fund dinner the naacp freedom fund dinner in detroit uh the vice president has has spent time here as well and Numerous uh, leaders in the Biden administration has also spent time here. You know, he has three offices, his campaign site, three offices alone in, in Detroit, and want to do that outreach uh, to tell their story and what the president has done. So I think that's going to be positive. I think also for us, you're going to see some reverse coattails as, as well, too. So those that are trusted, you know, elected officials, state representatives in, in, in several of the districts that, that we are looking to, um, uh, to hang on to and, and to win, you know, those trusted resources and people are there. So I think that's going to help uh, there. So, so I think that partnership is going to be strong and, and I, I'm really excited, I think, about what the president will be able to do in Michigan. Finally, how are you enjoying being Speaker of the House? <laughs> um, it, it's been good. You know, I, I think it has been um, everything that I heard about and more uh, just being in this role. But, you know, looking, you know, first and foremost, I, I'm just incredibly proud of, of my, my caucus and the House Democrats and the staff around because we've been doing a lot of good work, putting people first. Um, at the end of the day, that's that's been our focus, and we've been successful, and that, that's something that we can can be proud of. So, I, I'm really proud of that, and and that makes the role exciting because we're actually getting things done for for our constituents. Speaker Joe Tate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Three. That was Speaker of the House Joe Tate with uh, Mishmash's Shana Roth here on 1019 WDET, part of our coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference, which continues in just a moment when we'll have our reporter roundtable telling you all the things you need to know from this year's event.
It's our continuing special coverage of the Mackinac Policy Conference here live from Mackinac Island. I'm Nick Austin. And with so many lawmakers in one place, so many uh, speeches happening, so many people to talk to, it can be a lot to cover. That's why, since I can't be everywhere at once, we've got some of the people who are working to cover it right now to wrap things up and let you know what you need to know about this year's event. It's our reporter roundtable, and this year I am pleased to be joined by three of the best in the game, starting with Lauren Gibbons, Michigan State government reporter with Bridge Michigan. Lauren, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Clara Hendrickson, politics reporter for the Detroit Free Press. Thank you, Clara. It's great to be here. Also, Russ McNamara, host of All Things Considered, airing weekdays at 4 right here at WDET, anchoring our coverage. We're going Russ. deep into the bench today, I see. Hey, we got to do it sometimes. <laughs> You're my number three hitter. That's a good spot to be in. But Lauren, we're going to start with you as our resident veteran of these events, plus someone I don't get to speak to live in face-to-face face mode that often what's your big takeaway from being up here for these two days at the conference you know i think it's clear that just the number of people who are here the the power players who are here um it's it's an election year there's a lot of buzz there's a lot of excitement and uh we're talking to a lot of business folks a lot of a lot of politicos who are really keyed in to some of these issues. And overall, some of the issues that are being discussed are issues that a lot of people are talking about. You know, high wage jobs, um, the economy, all of these things are going to be um, aspects of the 2024 election. I hear about inflation all the time or, or, you know, just just whether the jobs that are coming in are high quality. What brings people to Michigan and how can we boost our population? These themes have been coming up and up and up and many of the past policy conferences are continue to be important issues today. It does seem like a continuing conversation there. There was celebration of the fact that Detroit had a rising population as well as Michigan first time together since they were talking back in the 50s. But Claire, what was your big takeaway from t- uh, this year's conference? Well, I think the big takeaway is sort of going to be what comes off the island. Mm. There's this tradition in Michigan where business leaders and politicians gather on this car-free, fudge-filled island and roll out the latest and greatest policy idea, right? And last year we heard Mayor Mike Duggan announced a land value tax plan that he wanted to implement in Detroit that has completely stalled in the state legislature. And so some of the things that get announced here, you know, don't make their way off the island. So I'm going to be keeping my eye on what, what leaves the island. We heard Governor Whitmer announce an ambitious statewide goal of increasing housing to tackle a housing shortage in Michigan. Michigan, um, what kind of progress on that front are we going to see uh, with the deadline that she has set? And housing so key. Everybody knows we don't have enough of it, especially affordable. We will have to pay attention to that. Russ, what is it for you? Well, I mean, uh, a lot of it is like, who isn't here? I mean, it is an election year. Uh, there's not, this place is not crawling with Republicans. Uh, Eric Nesbitt only got to the island today. Mike Rogers, who's running for Senate, he's not here. So uh, is the event losing some of its shine, I guess, that they called off the, the, uh, the senatorial debate? And I don't know, the things that are being announced here are pretty tame. Uh, we don't have a land value tax this year. We don't have a growing My T- uh, Michigan Together Council being uh, announced this year. I, if I hear about another corridor... I might lose my mind because it's like, okay, we have an innovation corridor going in between Michigan Central Depot and Ann Arbor. Great. These, these are all theoretical things that business people like to talk about. And then does it happen? I mean, are, are, are we seeing growth in that matter? Well, this is put on by the Detroit region, so there is the business focus. I know, I know. We're, I'm biting the hand that feeds us, but come <laughs> no, on. No, but you, it's interesting that you mentioned the lack of Republicans because it's clear that they want to have coverage from both sides, talking about bridging the future together. Some would say the most high-profile speaker for, or uh, speaker was former Speaker Paul Ryan, but that was from a national ne- level, not seeing it but so much from the Michigan he's been level. Out, he's been out of the business. Like, well, he, right. He's, he's in, you know, over the dark side now in lobbyist territory and has his own projects. He's... He's no longer an active or an interesting legislative component. He might have provided some star power a decade ago. 
Ross brings up a really good point about the Senate debate. That was what I was here for. That right. was what I was excited about. Um, and, you know, that fell apart just a few days before the conference started. And, and that was something that I think a lot of people were really hoping to see, a bipartisan, you know, just a, a swan song from everybody, just seeing where everybody stands at this point ahead of a primary in what's going to be a really competitive election. And it was a little disappointing to see that fall through. If the theme of this conference is bridging the future together, was there anything the three of you saw, I mean, we can start with you, Clara, that would key into that point? Or did you think it was just kind of like a prevailing theme just to get us all up here? <laughs> uh, well, I think when I, I mean, my focus has been interviewing the politicians. Right. Uh, and when I take stock of what's transpired in the state legislature coming up to now, not a ton of big bipartisan policy wins that lawmakers can really point to. A lot of um, sort of stagnation in the state house as they were tied um, with the same number of Democrats and the same number of Republicans, which could have in theory opened the door to some bipartisan legislating. We haven't totally seen that. And now, you know, this this happens right when the budget is, is around the corner. So what are we going to see in terms of other policy goals yeah. um, get accomplished besides just funding government here in Michigan? It is an election year. You wonder if that's maybe one of the reasons why people are a little bit more shy of being out there with some policy proposals, trying to get packed in, win some elections. Lauren, is there anything that happened here that you would deem newsworthy or something we talk about the importance of getting up here. Anything newsworthy you found? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, well, Claire brought up the housing yeah. I initiative. I think that's kind of interesting. But where I where I continue to, you know, I guess struggle or, or think about, you know, what happens now? Um, we talked about the Population Council a little bit. That was announced last year. They released their reports, and it is things that technically Republicans and Democrats can agree on. We want better roads. We want better education opportunities. We want people to get paid better and have these job opportunities uh, that, that people actually want. And that costs money, and that's very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so when you have these conversations, we're here uh, a year since that population council has happened. There haven't been meaningful progress on that issue in particular. And I think those are some of the biggest issues here that people keep bringing up, that people want to work on. And, and the problem is that those things are really hard. Now, Russ, you've been having interviews up here. What have you been noticing from your talks? Well, I mean, we talk about the Growing Michigan Together Council, and I talked with Ned Staler from Tech Town yesterday. And Ned's like, I've been preaching, I've been preaching this for 20 years. So he's like, it, it, we didn't really learn anything new, but maybe now there's the initiative to actually put some money behind it. I know uh, transit is going to come up huge in the state budget this year, so that's interesting. Also, getting back to the political side a little bit, uh, Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan said to endorse uh, Council Member Mary Waters for the 13th congressional seat today. I'm interested to see if that moves the needle at all because they're going up against someone with a lot of money uh, being brought in and self-funded in Sri Tanada. Yeah, Adam Ollier knocked out of the uh, running, of course, because he didn't have uh, proper signatures, as we've learned. Uh, Clara, you've also been doing reporting up here. What do you think listeners need to know and take away here from your time on Mackinac? I think Russ really got at the heart of the matter where it's sort of this gathering every year talking about the same challenges that Michigan faces that haven't gone away and sometimes a clear through line between policy solutions that have been put forward and so then it always comes back to where is the political will to get this done you gather all these people together in theory they can get on the same page about a good idea to, to solve education in Michigan to lure new residents to the state where is the will? Yeah. Lauren, give you the last word. I got about 30 seconds, man. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think the benefit for us as reporters is just to be able to have these conversations a little more openly. When everybody's trapped on an island, yes. <laughs> you know, you can't get off unless there's you a ferry. You can't take the horse over the water. <laughs> exactly, that's for sure. Exactly. No. So, so it has been great to, you know, have those opportunities to talk with people and see where people are at. But, yeah, for me, I think, I think this is kind of the opening salvo for a very busy election year. And, and even though we didn't get the Senate debate, I think a lot of people wanted to see, um, you know, we're hearing a lot of these themes, these issues that are going to keep coming up and up and up. Yeah, Lauren Gibbons, Michigan State government reporter with Bridge Michigan, Claire Hendrickson, politics reporter for the Detroit Free Press, and Russ McNamara, host of All Things Considered. Thank you all for joining us on WDET. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for having us.
And that's going to do it for this hour's day two special coverage of the 2024 Mackinac Policy Conference. Big thanks to our sponsor, Optic Birmingham and Optical Boutique, where you can find original, never worn, vintage, and exclusive contemporary eyewear. They made this year's coverage on the island possible. You can find more info at OpticBirmingham.com. You're listening to 1019 WDET FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. If you like what you hear, make sure to go to WDET.org to support the show. Special thanks to the production team on the island, Matt Trevethan and Nate Bender, back home taking care of us in Detroit. We'll see you next time. WDET is supported by the College of Business Administration at University of Detroit Mercy. UDM is offering a new master's degree in ethical leadership focused on sustainable, ethical, and inclusive problem solving. More information at business.udmercy.edu.